The first step for most researchers and academics to think about when it comes to copyright is how it influences which materials they can use in their own work. One reason this issue has become more important in recent years is the increased emphasis on academic integrity. This is a set of core values underpinning an ethical research process which is important not just to preserve the robust nature of individual work but the wider research landscape as a whole. Copyright and academic integrity mainly intersect when we talk about referencing. It's important to make sure that whenever you're using the ideas or work of others or even your own formally published materials that you properly reference these. This can help you to avoid any accusations of misconduct and potential penalties. When reading about copyright, you'll often come across the phrase third party materials. Essentially, this just means work that was created by someone else and to which they then own the copyright. You can see a range of examples on the screen of some of the most common items you're likely to come across in a research context. What a lot of researchers don't realise is that this can also include work that they have created and published. It's important to remember that economic rights in an item can be sold or given away. If you transfer copyright in a work to a publisher, then you have to treat it the same as if someone else had created it, including referencing it according to whichever convention you're following. There may also be limits on how much of a copyright work you're allowed to use in your own, but there are some guidelines that can help you to plan. The first of these is something known as copyright exceptions and it can be a confusing area. Copyright exceptions are conditions which allow you to use excerpts of otherwise copyright works without explicit permission for a defined list of reasons such as educational use. The two most common exceptions used by researchers are those for non-commercial and private study and illustration for instruction. These exceptions recognise that in order for students to learn, it will be necessary for them to read, listen to or view material that's in copyright. As always, the source of the material should be fully acknowledged in the appropriate referencing style. There are a few important things to remember about copyright exceptions. They shouldn't be used as an excuse to infringe copyright, but as a way to help researchers build on the work of others and learn in a legal and ethical way. It's important to think about terminology and what this means you're allowed to do. The exceptions allow use of some materials for educational reasons. This has a very specific definition, sharing materials with a defined cohort of students taking part in a dedicated course of study. It doesn't mean just doing something with the general aim of educating people by sharing knowledge with the wider world. Researchers may be allowed to use excerpts of copyright material in a presentation to a class group as this is classed as educational use. However, live streaming that same session online for anyone to watch would count as wider broadcast and would therefore not fall under the definition of educational use. This brings us on to another important distinction, non-commercial research and private study. Most researchers will have used photocopying or scanning services to make copies of works such as an article from a journal or a chapter from a book and this is done under this exception. However, it's important to note that this is done for your own study purposes only and that no one else will use the copy that you've made. This becomes an issue when researchers want to share their work more widely, including making a thesis available online. This activity takes it out of both the educational and personal contexts and counts as publication. So these copyright exceptions no longer apply. Another area researchers may have heard of is fair dealing. This is sometimes wrongly called fair use, but although they're similar terms, they mean different things. Fair use is a US doctrine and doesn't apply in other countries, including the UK. Fair dealing isn't an exception to copyright, but actually a defence to be relied on in court, so hopefully one that you'll never have to use. There is, however, some overlap. The principle of fair dealing applies outside educational settings and states that you can use limited copies of copyright material with full credit for certain purposes, such as those you can see on the screen. You can use extracts for your own private study. You can quote sections in the context of a review as part of an instruction or as part of a parody or pastiche. Although there isn't a concrete definition of the amount of copyright work researchers can use, 
the Intellectual Property Office recommends that any use should not negatively impact the financial market for the original and that the amount is necessary to the new work. The question we're told to ask is how would a fair-minded and honest person deal with the work? Best practice when wanting to use third-party materials is to seek permission from the copyright holder as this will ensure that your use is fully covered. Any researchers wanting to publish work containing third-party materials will need to do this, including when sharing their thesis online via Apollo, the university repository. Here we're going to share some of our top tips for getting permission to make sure the process is as painless as possible. It's best to start trying to obtain permission early, ideally as soon as you realise you're likely to need to use something. Sometimes the process can take time, and by starting early you can avoid a last minute rush. If you're not sure who the copyright holder is, the publisher is usually the best place to start and they can always point you in the right direction if it's not them. It's important that you outline exactly what you want to use and why. Be very specific here and include a full reference to material so that there's no confusion. You should also clearly explain why you want to use the material, including both educational and non-educational usage. Remember that sharing a thesis online counts as publication and that just because a copyright holder has given permission for something to be used in an academic context doesn't mean they'll be happy with wider sharing. This is known as obtaining informed open consent. You should outline exactly what you plan on doing with your output from submitting it for examination through to any type of formal publication. It's important that you get permission in writing. In smaller disciplines, or other circumstances where you might personally know the copyright holder, it can be tempting to just ask for permission, but having a paper trail is important for everyone's protection. You also need to acknowledge this permission. For example, the phrase image is used with permission of Fitzwilliam Museum and fully reference the original source. If you don't get a response to your initial queries about use, you can try again, but it's important to know when to stop. If you've tried a couple of times and not had a response, it might be time to move on. This will then give you time to think about alternatives you might include instead, or how you might approach any redaction. And finally, it's really important to remember that not getting a reply doesn't mean that you've been granted permission. It just means that your emails are being ignored. You always need that written permission to do exactly what you're aiming to do in order to reuse materials outside of educational exceptions.